Section 7.4, ionization energy. The ionization energy of an atom or an ion is the minimum energy required to rip off an electron from that ground state or its um, lowest energy state. So if I steal an electron, then I have to pay for it with energy. And the ionization energy is how much does it cost to steal that electron. So whatever ones are not protected are cheaper. The ones that are more closely held are more expensive. So the ionization energy will have trends as it goes uh, across a periodic row or down a column. Okay, so let's kind of look at the column first. If I have um, in the first in the first column, very very that uh, electrons are very very close to the nucleus. The nucleus is pulling it very very tight. It would be very hot, hard to rip it off because it's so close. Uh, but if I have something down here, seven seven away, it's going to be very easy to rip that off because it's far away from the nucleus. Plus, you have all of the other uh, electron rows are in between, kind of reducing not just the distance, but also the effective nuclear charge, reducing that pull of the nucleus to, the, to that last electron. So when you go down, say, down the periodic column, you're going to get less and less and less and less uh, expensive to steal. So if you steal something from francium down here, this is francium, francium would be very cheap to steal that electron because it's first of all uh, far away from the nucleus and it's also um, one electron out there by itself in the row. Okay, so as you go across the periodic table, as you go across a row, you're the ionization energy gets more and more expensive generally. And that is because of the nuclear, uh, the effective nuclear charge. Remember that if I have some protons in the nucleus and I have one electron on the outside and I've got some, some uh, shields, shielding of the electrons on the inside, the core electrons, then the more shielding I have, the cheaper this atom will be. So when I have, let's say I have another if I add one proton and add an electron, well, this, this second electron that's out here in the valence shell is not shielding it. It's on the same level of it, but yet I've got twice as, I've got another proton pulling. So as you go across the row, the, uh, the, inec the effective nuclear charge is higher and higher and higher, so it's pulling it closer and closer and closer. We saw that the uh, atomic radius, radius got smaller as you went across the row because it's being tight, tightly held in closer to the nucleus. Well, it's, it is, if it's held in closer, it's going to be harder to steal that electron. The, the less guarded it is, the cheaper. The more guarded it is, the uh, more expensive. So you end up with, say, lithium. Let's look at lithium here. Lithium is low because it's in the first column. It has one in its outer shell, and so it's very cheap to steal. As you go across towards neon, it's going to get more expensive. Okay, so neon has eight in its outer shell. It's held very closely, held very tightly, and so it's not going to have it ripped off very easily. Then when you go from neon down to the, you know, to the next one, to, to sodium, it's going to be cheaper again. And then it's going to head up to argon. Now, we're going to try to cover a little bit of why you've got the jiggy jags. Why doesn't it just go up like a hill? Why does it go down and up a little bit? Um, and that's yeah, it's pretty easy to explain, actually. I'll, I'll try to help. So this is a uh, clear graph. You've got lithium, okay, and then you get beryllium. That makes sense that it would be higher because it's, it's closer to neon. It's being held tighter, but it's cheaper to steal boron than it is to steal beryllium. And immediately you're like, why would it be cheaper to steal boron? And then again, you see here, it's cheaper to steal oxygen than it is to steal nitrogen. Why? Okay, so it, you have to explain that based upon the where those electrons happen to be. 
if you were to have um, lithium, lithium is going to be the 2s1, okay, 2s1, and beryllium will be 2s2. Okay, so that, remember, the S is the cheap rooms. If you have any extra electrons more than beryllium, you have to then go up to the P subshell. And the P subshell is more expensive, energy-wise. It's more expensive to go into the, more, the, into the higher energy room than it was to be in the S. So, so boron is going to be in the P1, right? That means that it's more expensive to rip off the, the S2, since that's a full subshell, than it is to rip off the P1, which is out there by itself. So even though it's a higher energy level, it's out there by itself and more easily picked off. Here's beryllium again. So beryllium has a full subshell, the 2s2. Uh, boron, its final electron, is out there by itself in the p1. It's only one. Remember that you can fit six electrons in the p subshell, and there's only one here. And so it's more easily removed. It's only 800 kilojoules per mole rather than 900. So it's, it's substantially easier to rip it off because it's not a full subshell. So here's the nitrogen and the oxygen. The nitrogen, if you were to say that you've got P3, okay, so nitrogen is going to be uh, 2s2. So remember it has 1s2. 1s2, 2s2, and then it goes into the P's, but I only have... So that's four, five, six, seven. Nitrogen has seven, so that means each girl's going to get her own room. Each girl's going to get her own room. So if you have oxygen, it's similar to that. That's full, that's full. But I have one more electron like that. And it's cheaper to steal this one than it is to steal one from an orbital so that there would be none in an orbital. It's more stable to have an electron in each orbital than it is to have two in one orbital. So to steal one, one and leave at least one electron in each orbital is cheaper. That's why the oxygen is cheaper than the nitrogen.